Hello, I'm Casey Dinges, Senior Managing Director for the American Society of Civil Engineers. Thanks for joining us today for a discussion on the state of women in civil engineering. My guest today is Stephanie Slocum, a structural engineer and associate principal at the women-owned firm Hope Fuhrer Associates. Thanks for being here, Stephanie. You're welcome. You recently finished a book called She Engineers, Outsmart Bias, Unlock Your Potential, and Create the Engineering Career of Your Dreams. What prompted you to write this book, and, and who's your audience? In one word, frustration prompted me to write this book. Ooh, tell us more. We hear a lot about getting more women and men into the STEM fields um, and increasing our pipeline through K through 12 in university. But what happens, especially to the women, once they get into the career workforce? Mm -hmm. Where is all that support then? So I wrote this book to bridge a gap in support for the women. Statistically, we know that 40% of the women that have engineering degrees never enter the workforce or they drop out. Worse, one in four after age 30 drop out. So it's not that they're not interested in engineering, it's that when they get here, they don't have the support that they need to thrive in their careers. Okay, so let's get into this a little bit. So as a woman civil engineer, what do you think are some of the biggest issues facing women in the engineering field? So I see three major issues facing women in civil engineering. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is denial that there is any gender bias at all. Uh, most of the research shows that 70% of women and across the engineering fields, not just civil, say that they think gender bias has had some, something to do with their career, while 40% of men and their employers say, oh, there's no gender bias in our industry. That's an issue. Um, I think number two is the lack of female mentors and role models. Um, when you look at the top, if you look at who's running engineering firms, the majority of them are men. So when women come into the field and they say, okay, who, what do I want to be in 40 years? Where do I want to go? There's not a lot of women up there. Uh, and those that are may not have the time or resources to help bring up the next generation of women. Uh, and the third issue, I think, is not just a, a woman's issue, but a maybe cultural millennial issue with the young engineering workforce, is that there aren't a lot of options for part-time, flexible hours, um, maybe mm. more integration of work and life. And I think if we want to attract the best and the brightest to civil engineering and our competition are other engineering fields like computer engineering where those options are more available, we're going to have a tough time. So the other engineering fields are a little better at some of the, the work-life balance issues? Um, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, you're, you're going to have long hours as mm -hmm. an engineer. I mean, that, that's part of it. But when you come to work as an engineer, you love what you do, and it's not so much work, I mm -hmm. guess, when you love what you do. But I do feel that some of the, you know, especially around the computer fields, mm -hmm. there's a lot more opportunities for remote work. Uh, than there is, and there's not as much of an emphasis on FaceTime as there is in the project-based civil engineering world. With women just composing 14% of the civil engineering workforce, what can the profession do to help close the gender gap? So I think the biggest thing we can do is uh, address the denial um, thing about gender bias occurring. Um, we just need to be aware that when we're talking to people and making decisions, whether it be about promotions or pay or anything of that nature, are we making the same decision if it is a male we're talking about as opposed to a female? Mm -hmm. Are we saying the same things in the same way if it's a male or a female? Mm -hmm. Are we not giving women the feedback they need to grow because we all need constructive feedback, both good and bad, mm -hmm. and are we not giving that because we're afraid of hurting someone's feelings? Uh, I, think, I think that's a large part of helping the profession. You're kind of getting you know. into my next question, and that is how do we overcome the unconscious biases, which I think you're suggesting here, mm -hmm. that are still prevalent in the workforce? You know, how do we get past that? Right. So I think to stop unconscious bias really needs to start at the individual level. Mm -hmm. When you're talking to someone, when you're making a decision about who gets what projects, um, who does what task in the office, you really need to think about are you making this decision based on you know, what you think a male should do or what you think a female should do. Um, what I found is you know, we all have unconscious bias. I have unconscious bias, you have unconscious bias, and typically it's, we are not bad people, it's how we were brought up. 
So for one example, you know, one time mm -hmm. some guys brought in some cookies into the office and mm -hmm. I said, oh, thank you, wife, for that. Right there, that's unconscious bias at mm -hmm. work. Because you assumed because they I didn't assumed, make them. Exactly. I assumed something mm -hmm. based on how I was brought up mm -hmm. that was, you know, wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we need to start not assuming and asking people what they want. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not just gender. I mean, that occurs when someone assumes someone who doesn't have a family mm -hmm. can work those extra hours without talking to them. Or when someone assumes mm -hmm. a single mom can't get a high profile project because it requires a lot of travel. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's those decisions that take place without us even knowing about them, mm -hmm. I think that are th the crux of the issue. Mm -hmm. So in that case, management could just say, hey, we're thinking of you to handle a, a high, pro high profile project, but we realize you've got other challenges in your life. Can we have that discussion up front before Precisely. we make a decision? Precisely. That, that sort of thinking is exactly what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. The issues of diversity and inclusion are big mm -hmm. societal issues in this country and really around the world um, and in our industry. What is the value of having a diverse engineering workforce? There's a couple of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, first we can talk about what makes a high performing team. Um, so a high performing team, there's been a bunch of research on that. Uh, Google studied a bunch of mm -hmm. their groups and they found the number one thing for a high performing team is trust. Okay, so trust sounds like kind of a frou-frou non-engineering concept, but to create trust you have to be willing to listen to others, accept different viewpoints, um, and generally not assume, which we were talking about right. earlier. What happens when you create trust in a high performing team? You make more money. So as engineers, you know, we all want to make more money. We all want to be highly successful um, have our teams and our firms be very profitable uh, and that having a diverse group brings more people from different viewpoints, brings more ideas and allows all of those ideas to come to fruition for an innovative civil engineering profession. So you're saying diversity equals success and more money. And more money. Hard to argue with that. Thanks for joining me, Stephanie. For more information on the Interchange program, visit ASCE.org slash interchange. Thanks for tuning in today, and we'll see you next time on the ASCE Interchange.